Yes, um, as said, my name is Johannes Krupp, and I'm currently a PhD student with CISPR at Saarland University, and today I'm going to present joint work with Michael Buckes and Christian Rosso, namely identifying the scan and attack infrastructures behind amplification DDoS attacks. So, in a nutshell, what is this about? Um, we have a good guy here, and he's running some critical infrastructure, like, for example, serving cat pictures, and of course, we also have a bad guy who wants to attack the service. In our case, he will run a so-called denial of service attack and just flood the system with lots of traffic, which causes the server of the good guy to die and nobody's able to see cat pictures anymore, which is of course very upsetting in the internet. So our big question is, who is the bad guy? Can we find out who's behind this? Now, you might think that's a rather easy task, like just look at where the traffic's coming from, but it's actually not that easy because in our case, we're talking about so-called amplification DDoS attacks. Amplification DDoS attacks are a special form of reflective denial of service. And in those attacks, the attacker will abuse some service on the internet, and he will leverage two fundamental flaws in our current internet. The first flaw is that the header of the IP version 4 information is not authenticated in any way. So when I send a packet, I can write whatever I want to into the header information. Which means that the attacker can send requests to those servers, but he can craft them in such a way that these packets will look as if they were coming from the victim, actually. Now, at this point, the second flaw comes into play, namely, UDP protocol does not have a handshake. In the TCP protocol, whenever you want to receive data, you ask the server to send you data, the server asks back whether you're okay with this, and finally, after this, you actually get the data. On the other hand, in UDP, there is no such handshake. So you ask for data, you get data which in this case means that those reflectors will just happily send their responses to the victim. Now, what makes amplification DDoS so bad is that the attacker will not just select any reflectors, but he will select them carefully such that their response will be much bigger than the request. This gives the attacker an effective bandwidth amplification. And although this sounds weird, there are actually lots of protocol out there which have this property. One example is the old character generator protocol, which was used for internet testing and is one of the legacy protocols, but it's still out there. But also widely used protocols such as NTP, the network time protocol, or DNS, the domain name system, are vulnerable to this attack. Why do we care about amplification attacks? Um, well, for one, they're relatively easy to launch. All you need to know is a list of amplifiers and a source that can send out spoofed packets. You don't have to um, build a botnet, you just need a list of amplifiers, launch packets, done. The second point is they're actually very powerful. And the past has shown that there were attacks with 300 gigabits, 400 gigabits, 500 gigabits, and also the very recent attack on DIN was partially caused by amplification DDoS. If we look at such an attack from the victim's perspective, we see the victim receives a lot of traffic, but only from the amplifiers. This means the traffic we see at the victim has no direct contact with the attacker. So it's of very little help in finding the attacker. If you look at this from the amplifier's perspective, things look better at first because the amplifiers actually do receive traffic from the attacker, but all the traffic they receive has spoofed source addresses. So it's also not of much help. There have been some previous approaches in finding the origin of spoofed traffic, and those are fall mainly into two categories, namely flow analysis and packet marking. The idea of flow analysis is to collect traffic statistics at many routers in the internet, so-called flow data, and use this to trace back the origin of packets. However, this has one fundamental issue, namely it requires multiple ISPs to collect flow data in the first place and then collaborate and share this flow data to find out the origin. And clearly this is not happening in the internet as we know today. The second approach, packet marking, has the idea of encoding the routing information into the packet itself and use this to reconstruct the path. And while this works very nicely, it requires changing the fundamental protocols or the implementation of routers. And also PASS has shown that this is not happening. So both of these approaches are impractical to deploy at global scale. So in our case, we thought maybe we can take a step back and have a look from the outside. And one idea we had is, okay, there are multiple servers out there in the internet how does the attacker actually know that he can use exactly those to launch the attack? 
Well, clearly someone at some point must have found out and then told the attacker. And we call this someone a scanner. A scanner just sends requests to multiple machines and records back the replies. And the nice thing about scanning is that during scanning, you cannot really spoof your source address because you're actually interested in receiving the reply. So this means the amplifiers have direct contact with the scanner and actually can learn the identity of the scanner. So why not, as a new goal, we try to find the scanner instead first? Why is finding the scanner helpful? Well, we can think of two scenarios. In the first scenario, the scanner scans the internet, finds a list of amplifiers, and then shares this with the attacker. So if we now can identify the scanner, we basically have identified an accomplice of the bad guy, which is somewhat. Um, on the other hand, also, scanning is not really that hard. There are tools like ZMAP and MassScan that allow you to scan the entire IP version 4 range in less than an hour, order of a few minutes. So it could also very well be that actually the scanner and the attacker are the very same person. And in this case, if we found the out who is the scanner, we actually would have found out who is the attacker. Of course, since the internet is big, there's not only one scanner and one attacker, but multiple attackers, multiple scanners. So what we need is some way of linking them together. For this, we leveraged a previous work, namely MPOT, which was presented by Kramer et al. at RAID 2015, which is a honeypot for amplification DDoS attacks. It works by emulating a lot of protocols which are known to be abused, namely NTP, DNS, Trojan, and several more. And the goal of this honeypot is to be selected as an amplifier in attacks. And then during those attacks, the honeypot, of course, can lock lots of useful data, like who's the target, when did the attack start, when did it end, how many packets were sent, and so forth. For this work, we extended MPOT with what we call selective response. And the basic idea of selective response is that based on the addresses of both the scanner and the honeypot, the honeypot will either reply or act as offline. So for example, if the orange scanner sends a request to the honeypot, the honeypot will send back a reply. But if the purple scanner here sends a request to, back to, uh, to the honeypot, the honeypot will not reply. Now, this sounds very useless at first, but what we did is we not only installed one of those honeypot, but a number of those. And now if the orange scanner comes along and scans the first honeypot, the first honeypot might reply to the scanner. He might go to the second one, the second one might not reply. He might ask the third one, which might reply again. And then he will scan an entire network, some will answer, some will not. And after scanning the entire network, the orange scanner will have found exactly this set of honeypots that replied to him. If now another scanner comes along, the purple one, he could ask the first one and the first one will not reply. He could ask the second one, the second one might now reply to the purple one. He could ask the third one which might reply and so on and so forth. So after scanning our entire network, the purple scanner will have found this set of honeypots, which is different from the one the orange scanner found. So what we've effectively done is we've imposed a fingerprint on the scanner. And we can use this fingerprint to link back attacks. How? Well, easy. If we see an attack that's using exactly this set of honeypots, having this attack signature, we can just compare the signature of the attack to the fingerprints we dealt out. And we find, OK, this attack was caused by information that was found by the orange scanner. And if we see an attack which is using those honeypots, we can again compare the attack signature to the fingerprints and find out purple scanner. We implemented this with 48 honeypots, out of which 24 will always reply, which means that we can hand out 32 trillion unique fingerprints. So for some technical reasons, we had to split our honeypots into three networks, and we wanted to have homogeneous performance within each network, which means that out of 16 honeypots per network, eight will always reply, which reduces the number of unique fingerprints from 32 trillion to 2 trillion. But that's still okay because there are only 4 billion valid IPv4 addresses anyway. So basically, every scanner can have a unique fingerprint. So are we done? Not quite, because in the real world, things are not always as nice as we wish they are. For example, scanners could only scan parts of our network, or a text could, combine, uh, could use only a few honeypots they found, or a text could combine multiple scan results from multiple scanners, or they could have their intel from somewhere entirely else, which we don't know, did not even consider. So when matching attack signatures against fingerprints, we can have three different outcomes. The first one is the attack matches a single scanner. 
which is the case we want, and we will denote this as a unique match. The second case is the attack could match multiple scanners, and we will denote this as a non-unique match. And thirdly, also, the attack could match no scanner that we know of, so we, could, we denote this as no match. We collected data for over five months, and during this time recorded 1.3 million attacks. And luckily, out of those, 80% have a unique match for scanners in our data set. Means that only a single scanner learned the signature of this attack. Further, 18% of all attacks had a non-unique match. And this is mainly caused by attacks using only a very, very small signature, like only two or three honeypots. And then finally, less than 3% have no match at all. And while this could have many reasons, one reason we found is that our honeypot ag aggressively aggregates multiple attacks. So if there are two attacks in short succession, it might very well be that the honeypot just considers them both as one attack. And in this case, we cannot find a matching scanner. So this is all nice and good, but how can we actually be certain that if we have a unique match, it's actually was the scanner, and it's not just happening by coincidence. Or put differently, how likely is it that we get a match just by pure chance? Now, as our fingerprints have uniform distribution, we can actually answer this using basic combinatorics. Namely, the probability of a match by chance is just the number of all matching fingerprints divided by the number of all fingerprints we have. The number of all fingerprints can be computed as just the number of all honeypots we have. Choose the number of honeypots that will reply. And the number of matching fingerprints can be computed similarly by the number of all honeypots we have minus the size of the attack signature. Choose the number of honeypots that will re reply minus the size of the attack signature. Um, we can plot this. So we can say, OK, we have the uh, size of the attack signature on the x-axis and the probability on the y-axis. Notice that the y-axis is in log scale. And if you plot this, it will look somewhat like this. We do not get a single graph, but a um, area that's bounded by two graphs, because in our case, the distribution, how the attack signature is distributed over the three networks we have, actually varies the probability a bit. However, what we can see is that the probability drops very quickly with small attack signature sizes already. So from this probability that one scanner matches, we can use the at least one semantic and compute the probability that a scanner does not match. And from this, by raising it to the number of all scanners we've seen so far, to the probability that no scanner matches by chance. And we will use this as our confidence that we are correct. So for example, if we had had contact with 10 scanners so far, this graph would look somewhat like this. Again, we have two curves because of the distribution over the three networks. Um, in this case, we can see that by using only eight honeypots in your text signature, we already have almost 100% confidence that if we find a unique match, it is correct. Of course, by having more scanners, this attack shifts slightly to the right. So if we have 100 scanners, then we need roughly 10 honeypots in our attack signature to be 100% confident. But even if we go up to 1,000 scanners, which is about the order we saw in our, in our um, experiments, we see that with 12 honeypots already, we're still in very good high confidence levels. And 12 honeypots is only half of what a scanner could have found. So looking back at the, at the results, we can actually see that for all high confidence level, still a large number of the attacks that we found matches. So if, for example, we want to have a confidence level of 90%, it means that at least, uh, uh, it's still 72% of all the attacks we found can be uniquely matched. And even if we go to absurdly high confidences like 99.999%, we're still at 48% of all attacks that we could uniquely identify. So with this, we consider the problem of linking scanners and attackers as solved. And that's great, but is it the best we can do? Well. Initially, we said that the scanner and the attacker could also very well be the same person or the same identity. And to find out whether this is the case, we need some additional feature. And the feature we selected and found is, why not use the location in the network of the attacker as a feature? Um, if we could find the location of the scanner and the location of the attacker, we could just compare the locations. If they're the same, they're very likely the same guy. So 
the problem is how do we find locations? If we think about GPS, our real world, there is the concept of trilateration. And this works in following simple steps. You pick a number of reference points according to the dimensionality of, of your space. So if we are in 2D, we need three reference points. Then you measure your distance to all the reference points. For example, we could have a distance of five to orange, a distance of three to green, and a distance of two to blue. And you then just compute the location from this distance vector. This computation works by taking spheres of the appropriate radius around the reference point. So we'll build a sphere of radius five about, around orange, a sphere of radius three around green, and a sphere of radius two about blue. And we'll find that all those intersect in a single point, which is the point we were looking after. The very nice feature about this is that the distance vector uniquely determines a location, meaning if the distance vector is the same, also the location was the same. And this sounds like a nice idea, but how can we apply this to networks? Well, first we need a distance measure, and secondly, we need to verify that it actually works because the internet is not a two-dimensional space. As a distance measure, luckily, there is a field in the IP version 4 header that we can abuse, namely the time to live. And this is initially used to prevent packets from being routed for all eternally in the network. And it works like this, that every hop along a path decrements the time to live by one. So if the orange scanner sends out a packet with an initial TTL of 64, the first hop will decrease to 63, the next one to 62, the third one to 61, and this will be the TTL at which the packet arrives at the purple uh, server. So from this, we can now subtract 61 from 64 and find that there were three hops on the path. And this gives us some distance measure in the internet. However, in our case, we have some problems with this. Namely, we don't know the initial TTL because we only know the TTLs as received by our honeypots. Secondly, routes in the internet are not really stable and may vary over time. And the internet still has an unknown topology, so we still don't know whether it actually works. To solve the problem of the initial TTL, consider this example network, where we have two honeypots, honeypot one and honeypot two, and two hosts, A and B. And we can compute the distances by looking here. The distance from A to one is two hops, the distance from A to two is four hops, and similar from B to one, we have three hops, and from B to two, we have one hop. And now we can plot the TTL measurements at both honeypots in such a graph, where the x-axis is the TTL as received by the first honeypot, and the y-axis is the TTL as received by the second honeypot. If now host A sends out a packet with an initial TTL of eight, we'll start on the diagonal at position eight eight, we can see that this will arrive with a TTL of six at the first honeypot and a TTL of four at the second, because of the distance two and four to honeypot one and two respectively. Similarly, if host A sets out a packet with initial TTL of five, it will arrive with a TTL of three at honeypot one and a TTL of one at honeypot two. And if host B sends out initial packets with initial TTL of say 13, this will arrive with a TTL of 10 at honeypot one and 12 at honeypot two. And if he sends out a packet with initial TTL of nine, this will arrive with a TTL of six at honeypot one and a TTL of eight at honeypot two. So what we can notice from this is that all the points from the same host lie on a line which is parallel to the diagonal. So maybe instead of comparing distance vectors, we can get away with checking whether measurements are placed on a diagonal line. And with this, we can also account for route changes. Our assumption for this will be that route changes in the internet do not incur drastic changes, but rather change by plus minus one or two. So we can simply say, okay, instead of checking whether measurements are placed on a diagonal line, let's just check whether they are within a neighborhood around a diagonal line. This solves the problem of unknown initial TTLs and route changes. We still haven't solved the problem of whether it actually works because we haven't known the topology. And for this, we just decided to perform an experiment. In our experiment, we selected 200 random probes from the RIPE Atlas project, which gives you access to some host from which you can then perform trace routes, pings, and whatever you want. And we sent packets to all our honeypots and measured the received TTLs. 
to get a sense of how route changes at small time frames, we sent three packets per measurement in 120 second intervals. And to get an idea of how route changes vary over long, longer periods of time, we repeated this measurement every six hours. And from there on, it's a simple optimization problem with the goal of recognize as many measurements from the same probe as being the same and distinguishing as many measurements as possible from different probes as being different. And this actually works quite nicely and we can say we can find such a graph where we can, for each number of reference points or reference measurements we have, we can find the acceptable threshold around the diagonal line. So if we want to have 95% confidence or only 5% false positives, we can see that if, for example, we have five reference measurements, we can accept a deviation of one around the diagonal line. Of course, if you want to get to higher confidence level, say 98%, then we can, this uh, threshold will decrease a bit and we will not match as much, but it still works. Now, if you go back to all the attacks that we could link with a confidence of 99.9% .9 or higher to their scan origin, we found that actually for 37% of those, the scan origin is very, very likely the same as the attack origin, namely with a confidence of 98% or higher. Meaning that over a third of all the attacks that we could link is very likely caused by the scanner itself. And in this case, we have found the actual source of the attack. So, to conclude, we implemented selective response and could use this to link scanners to attackers. And then using our TTL trilateration like method, we could find out whether a scanner actually is an attacker. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to take questions. So questions? Hi. Great talk, thanks. thanks. Um, I was wondering if the adversary is running a scanner from a v behind a VPN or through a tunnel, a Tor tunnel, how would that affect your results? Um, performing scans through a Tor tunnel. Um, as long as the entire scan is done from the same IP, like we see the same IP from all the Tor tunnels, we can still link this, but of course we will link the endpoint of the Tor exit node, right. But so far we have no evidence that attackers actually do this. But yes. Yeah, hi, very nice talk. So um, I wonder if the attacker knows about this technique or tactics that you use here. How possible is it to evade this? For example, can he enumerate all these uh, uh, honeypots that you have and then he can just randomly select whatever set of them to do so that will blind your signatures, for example? Um, well, finding out honeypots in our case is not that easy because of the selective response. Only very few honeypots will actually respond to you. So to find all of them, you would actually have to scan from a lot of different places, right? because with the selective response, only half of them will reply to you. Yeah, but that is, it's not a very tough task, right? If you have a botnet with several bots around sure. the blobs, then, you can use them. Then, then, then you, could, you, could, you could use multiple sources and combine the results, yes. Um, what we can say is that if the attacker now only combines a handful of um, scan results, we can simply increase the size of our network and make it not matching uniquely to single fingerprints, but uniquely to combinations of two or three fingerprints. This would simply need that we have more honeypots. But yes, if you use lots of lots of uh, resources to scan our, our honeypots, then yes, you could evade this. And also, isn't it possible also for the attacker to, even he's the same attacker, to use different IPs or different locations for scanning and for attacking, for example. Well, if he's using different locations for scanning and attacking, then simply in the last step, we will not make this link between scanner and attacker being the same. But we could still find out that all those attacks were based on information found by this very scanner. Uh, yeah, hey, thanks for the great talk. Um, have you considered, um, as far as I know, uh, by now, lots of ISPs try to prevent uh, IP packet spoofing. Um, so have you considered using that information to narrow down uh, the location of attackers? Because a potential attacker could not be in the network of an ISP which prevents uh, spoofing. That's right, yes. So in order to launch an attack, you need the ability to spoof packets. 
But no, we have not considered this. And thanks for the information. We will look into this. Yeah, thanks for talking. And just, I'm just wondering for the second part of your talk. So uh, I think there, there's a lot of um, free and commercial service available on the internet to just find the geolocation of the IP mm -hmm. address. I'm just wondering why you choose to use the triangulation uh, <laughs> to identify the IP address. Um, that's actually a good, good, good question. Um, the answer is very simple, because during an attack, you will not see packets from the original IP of the attacker. During an attack, all you will see is packets with spoofed sources. So you simply do not know the address of the attacker in this case. But using the triteration, we can have still features which cannot be spoofed easily and which we compa can compare. But then this is totally unrelated to geolocation, where you want to find the physical location of someone. But In our case, we just want to find whether the network routes are the same. But what are the features I mean, you use to, uh, to identify the attacker, or the original uh, the scanner? Is that the IP address or? Um, from the scanner, we can find the IP address, yes. From the attacker, we don't know, we, we don't have any identifier string. But from the attacker, with our second part, we can say, okay, all these attacks are based on results from this scanner, and they are very likely in the same network positions. They very likely have the same routes to our honeypots. Okay, thank you. Um, hi. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. Really a very interesting approach. Uh, my question actually is about the slide that we can see on the upper left. Um, I believe uh, during your presentation, the slide before, you explained the concept about uh, when uh, one honeypot, when, once it gets approached by a scanner, it will respond, but once it gets approached by a second scanner, it will not respond, mm -hmm. if I understood that correctly. Yes. So when I look at this slide, uh, I can see that, for example, the third honeypot from the left or uh, actually one, two, three, four, five, six, the eighth. seven, eight, the eighth, <laughs> yeah. He talks to both of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't really understand that because you said once it gets approached by one, it will not respond to the other. So how does this work? Okay, um, the decision actually is based on per computing the hash of the address of the scanner or the address of the source that sent the request, the address of the honeypot, and then some secret string from our side because we want to prevent that scanners actually can predict this. Okay. okay. And it's chosen such that from the hash, we will actually compute a permutation of our honeypots and then take the first half of them to respond. Mm -hmm. So you will get a uniform set of 24 honeypots that will always respond to one scanner. Okay, okay. And so this is how they make the decision. I will yes. talk to you and not talk to you. Yes. Okay. And then, of course, for multiple some scanners, the honeypot will reply to multiple of those, of okay. course. As long as you have a unique set of, of, of honeypots, you will know which, which guys, who's who, basically. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So we can take one more question. Okay, um, how about TTL spoofing, right? It's, it's not a new thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can just randomize the TTL, just make it large enough, like above five or above 10, and the rest is random. Well, you can, you, you can uh, randomize TTLs, and then it very depends on how you actually do randomize the TTLs. If you randomize TTLs per packet, we're still very good on our side because we will see a distribution of TTLs but of course, the largest TTL you will receive will be bounded by the length of the path to, it, to the attacker. But you need, so, I mean, we can discuss it at length, but you basically, you, you do it once per, per node that you scan, and on, as the attacker, you do an independent randomization. You send one packet per attack that you do, right? Per, per amplification attack. You don't, uh, in, in, a, um, in an amplification attack, the attacker will not send a single packet, of course, no. Yeah, but the attacker will send lots of them. But the result is that it's independent from the, from the source, so, so your matching won't work. Yes, we will, the, the second half of the matching will not work if this is done in a very, very good, good fashion. What we will still be able to do is find the IP of the scanner behind the attack and find the accomplice. Okay. Which is then most likely a relay or a botnet or something. I mean... We don't know yet. Yeah, thanks. All right, so let's thank Ioannis. Uh,